Okay, I'll call this regular meeting of council to order and I'll ask everyone if they can please rise for the national Okay, I'll now ask if there are any disclosures of pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof. Yeah. Alderman Hessels. Um, planning staff, PSA, uh, planning staff report, PSA, uh, no, planning staff 04 2018. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing no other declarations, we don't have any presentations tonight and we don't have any public hearings, but we do have one delegation tonight. So we have Mr. David Murray here, who is the first vice president of the Ontario Plowmen's Association. Um, and he's here regarding the International Plowing Match and Rural Expo. So uh, Mr. Murray, if you don't mind coming up to the podium, and um, if you just press the little button, the red light should come on and then you should be all set. Okay, sorry. Yeah, we need somebody that knows what's going on here. Anyhow, my name's Dave Murray. I'm the uh, first vice president of the Ontario Plowmen's Association, and thanks to Councillor Hessels, he, uh, we talked on the phone about the possibility of getting together to talk about the International Plowing Match and Rural Expo. Uh, we're actively looking for a place to have the plowing match in 2020, and I'm not sure whether all the councillors have ever been to the plowing match or know what the plowing match really is. And I can take a quick couple minutes and just tell you what it does. It's been on the go for a hundred years. The hundredth plowing match was in 2017. It was in Walton in Huron County. And the plowing, Ontario Plowmen's Association actually started in 1913. So uh, there were a couple years in the war that uh, there was no plowing matches due to the war restrictions, but the 100th plowing match was last year in 2017 in Walton. So it's a long-standing tradition that this event uh, moves around Ontario. Uh, it used to be a case where there'd be seven counties fighting for the opportunity to host this event. Uh, I guess the dynamic of rural Ontario, because there's lesser farmers, lesser it's more intensive agriculture, but there's just lesser uh, farmers out there and more urban people in communities, and I'm sure it's no different in this community than it is anywhere else. So the match has moved around the on Ontario every year. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, I checked, and the last time it was in Niagara, or it would have been Welland in Lincoln County, it was Welland County in 1926, and it was on Lundy's Lane in Niagara Falls. So that's the last time it's been in this particular area. It was uh, in, the last time it was in this area was in 1996, and it was in Haldem and Norfolk. Uh, maybe some of you attended that match. It rained a little bit before the match started, but uh, we uh, did all right, and we paid the bills and had a lot of fun. Uh, one of the objectives, there's two real objectives of the plowing match, and that's to bring a community together. It's, it takes about a thousand volunteers to put on the plowing match, and all of a sudden there's people in the community that you've never ever uh, 
seen or met before can become really good friends, you know, so it ties a community together. And the other real meaningful objective is it, it's intended to leave a legacy in the community. And in most years, it's three to $500,000 is the profits that are gained from having the plowing match. And that goes into back into the community. There's no personal gain. It just goes back into the community. Could be hospitals, could be agencies of whatever that uh, you see fit to support. So, you know, that's a, that's a real big thing when you can stand up at the end of one of these events and say, here, community, here's a half a million dollars for you. Uh, there isn't too many other endeavors that bring you that kind of uh, results in a community. So uh, we have a video that sort of explains it and talk about it a little bit after or, or whatever. This video was uh, built in 20, it was in Vermont, Dundas, and Glengarry, and this video was built particularly to encourage people to be interested in hosting this event. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to invite the whole province to your community? Every year, one community in Ontario does just that by hosting the International Plowing Match and Rural Expo. Thousands of visitors join plowing competitors and converge on a farm field turned newly sprouted city for a week of competition, education, entertainment and fun. Your community could host this unique event. Communities across the province have reaped the benefits of hosting the International Plowing Match and Rural Expo for over 100 years. Economic and community development are just a few of the many benefits that your community will enjoy hosting the IPM. Well, we know that economic development is important in all aspects of uh, rural development. The economic spin-off of motel, bed and breakfast and whatnot, and uh, it's, it's just a tremendous for our community. Would you come to Finch if the match wasn't here this year? I'd never heard of Finch before. <laughs> so it really draws out small communities across Ontario that people have never heard of or seen before. It gives them a chance to see part of Ontario. Same in New Lister, the year we were up to New Gave a whole bunch of people who would never have gone up there an opportunity to go up and see you. Well, the benefit uh, from what I can see up there is anywhere between 15 and 20 million dollars into the community, whether it's going into buying product for the IPM, or whether it's going into food, motels, and, and, and into the community that way. The thousands of people that come to your community and impact spending money here. They're going to the restaurants, the hotels, and whatnot, and they're supporting your community. People are filtering through on their way back because they're staying. Um, a lot of people are here for the whole week, so if they're not camping, they're staying at our local hotel. We also bank on tourism as well, so we look forward to hosting individuals who come with an interest in the agricultural field but have the opportunity to visit our west coast on Ontario's west coast. People are coming forward to volunteer uh, just because they want to help and they want to be a part of something that is so significant as the International Pine Match and Rural Expo. Well, I think the opportunity for people to work together on one goal, uh, the opportunity to showcase our area. The farm gates and the businesses that have put displays up and families that have uh, decorated their yards, it's, again, incredible. It's certainly a community benefit in that people in Eastern Ontario uh, are recognized as part of Ontario and gives them a benefit to, to share in the event. Uh, the, but the community involvement with, with uh, community groups, uh, Kwanians and those types of groups is, is tremendous. The other big benefit that I've seen over the years is how it gets groups across a county together. There's people I've met that I would never have met before and I think that's the, the best thing that's come out of this is just the people that you'll be friends with now for life. People that you would not meet any other way, they might be three or four roads away, become really good friends. 
the camaraderie and the social and the fun you have. The whole community really comes together. We really saw that um, about 10 days ago at the volunteer orientation where there was over 900 people out in a tent. People were exploding out of the sides of the tent in pouring rain. Uh, so it was just a way for the whole community to come together. There's even ur some urban people from Cornwall that came to help. The three counties helped. Just the people you got to know. That's really awesome. It's a lot of what can we do to help and how, how can I get involved. It's been a lot of fun watching that happen. Oh, it gets uh, the community, it, it gets kids out that don't know much about farming and the old way of doing things and it, it, uh, it helps out a lot that way. It, it makes a lot of people understand why we do it. What they learned firsthand, where their food gets produced. And the more people that know can tell their families and maybe there's better understanding of farmers. We had over 25,000 school children attend the show during the four days of the show and they had an experience that they would never get any other way. And we sometimes forget the importance of agriculture in our world. And especially if you're from the city like me, you just don't realize how really, really important it is. And it's a great opportunity to get back to those basics, get back to the roots, um, meet the people that make it happen, and see just what goes on in our great province. We think the International Pine Ranch and Rural Expo is one of those vehicles that we have to try and spread the word about where your food really comes from and what our agriculture producers really are up to. It was a truly an honour for uh, our family to be hosting the 2014 Air National Pine Match. We knew we would get compaction, but there's good equipment out today that, depending how bad the rains would be, maybe a couple of years, but now, the way it looks, I think we should be getting it out this year, if not next year. We chisel plowed the field, one half of the field um, last year twice after they took everything out. And this year I put oats on the field and yeah, the little service entrance where the main traffic was going in, the oats were a little shorter. But other than that, as far as our field as a whole, it, the plowing match never hurt. It's, it's great to be at a plowing match. It's just on the local level that we can meet and greet all our customers. So Hydro One is a proud supporter. Um, we build the, the city as well as the RV park um, that supplies electricity for this event can take place. And it took us five weeks to put in about 320 poles and roughly 19 kilometers of wire. With, uh, we had 11 apprentices, two foremen plus myself. So the plowing match owns the poles and wire on this site and on the RV site, there's a contractor owns it. We build it all for them. They supply it, it's all here, and then we build it. For Hydro One, um, this is an important event because it allows us to meet the customers, the communities, um, all the folks that we, we serve. All the local municipalities got together from a volunteer perspective and as well as logistics. So they helped with the traffic control, the counties helped immensely from that perspective, and then locally, each local municipality had additional jobs. So rallying the troops across the, the board. from each municipality yeah. got yeah. on board. We enjoy being here because of the people we meet and uh, we enjoy this show because it travels to so many different towns. We meet a large group of different people and we enjoy selling boots. In a row, I think we've done 12 years in a row. We've done it in the past, we skipped some, but we, I think it's been 12 in a row. Well, we're really pleased to be supporting agriculture and farming in our local communities across the province. We love that our bankers are able to engage with our customers in the rural setting, in their community, and meet new people. It's a great way to show our customers and potential customers our various products and services, and that we're here to help. Fifteen years ago, we were given the mandate by our members to approach the OPA and become official sponsors of the match. We use it as a venue to meet and greet our current policyholders and to look for new ones too. One of the services that OPA can provide to the local community, helping them to uh, actually find the appropriate grants and to be writing them and also to help implement those grants. And of course, the final report writing. The lasting legacy for me was that our the profits that we made were invested in the Kitchener Water Community Foundation. Over $365,000 went into that foundation. The interest income from that fund continues to feed back into the community over all these last 20 years. 
and our fund now stands at 420,000. We were lucky enough to kind of end up with about 500,000 that we donated uh, to the hospitals for equipment and uh, our hospitals that are located in our county and uh, that was the big thing. Every year there's two scholarships to people attending agricultural college and they're from the 2010 IPM scholarship fund so it's pretty neat to see that money continue to be used for good purposes like that, you know, five years after the fact. The municipality needs to understand that that volunteer horsepower stays in that community to take on other projects. I sh should. I absolutely should. I would say you need to take a chance. You need to look past the, the amount of work that it takes and look at the economic impact of what it can do for your region. It can really put a small town on the map and it can show people what you have to offer so that they'll maybe keep coming back as a tourist destination. It may be tough, maybe may think it's tough, but I think now that I've completed the whole thing, it's very rewarding. you got to showcase your county sometime. Like there's people in Ontario that don't know the different counties, the different areas, and it's a, it's a showcase is what, uh, what it is. And, uh, uh, I would recommend any county. I would suggest anybody get involved with it. It's uh, it's been a, almost a four-year process, but I think we're all going to be pretty sad when it's over. And uh, there's going to be that uh, you know, what am I going to do next kind of thing. So it's been fun. I started competing since 1986 at the international. So to be have the opportunity to host it, have all the plowmen from all across Ontario come to our farm. That was it. Was just to be. It was just an honor. I was in awe for the whole week. <laughs> it's always the same when you get here. Just like a family all together. It's a wonderful, wonderful program. From that, you can kind of see a little bit of what the plowing match does. Uh, just to expand on the, the area that it takes, uh, usually needs about a thousand acres to have this event. So there's probably no particular farmer that has a thousand acres all in one spot, but you end up working with a group of people uh, to, to make it happen. And you'll have people that'll say, yeah, I'll be involved. And the next guy will say, no way. And, so you go around their farm or you go a couple concessions down the road and continue with it. But the um, primary money maker for the plowing match is the Tented City. The Tented City is about 100 acres. It uh, comprises of seven streets, or in city terms, I define it as 28 square city blocks of exhibits. And uh, that houses about 500 exhibitors. So that's where you really get, you get uh, the community businesses to hook in and participate. You get a lot of national businesses. Uh, the farm equipment companies all participate and they come back and say it's a really good event. They, they get revenue, they get sales. And so it's, it's a real benefit that way. Uh, the other piece of it, as you probably saw in there, is we have a trailer park. And that trailer park is usually designed to house about a thousand campers. That can vary up and down, but in the last few years, there's a thousand campers come. So it's a pretty amazing city in itself that uh, these people come and uh, sometimes they don't even go in the plowing match at all. They just come because their friends come and we always put an entertainment tent in there. I think that tent's 200 by 300 feet long. It's a huge, huge tent and four o'clock in the afternoon, these people are all getting their lawn chairs ready to get a seat in that tent so they can listen to the entertainment at night. And that's all included in the, the cost of their rental of the trailer park. Uh, the plowing aspect is a, is a big piece of it too, and that's the sole reason we have this event. Uh, last year, there were over 200 plowmen participated from all across Ontario, Quebec. There's some plowmen from the States. We've had plowmen from the UK come over. So it's... Uh, it's an event that the plowmen really get excited about and want to participate. Uh, if you win at the international, you go to the Canadian plowing match, which is across Canada, 
And then if you win at the uh, Canadians, you get to go to the Worlds. And this year we had two Ontario boys. They went to Kenya in December and did, did very well over there uh, representing Canada. So that's kind of the, the growth of the thing. And, uh, and the other thing that it, it does, like, you know, you bring people to the community, they enjoy the plowing match, and, you know, the long-term benefit is if there's things, there's things in every community that are of interest to people and you want them to come back and see the area again. And the Niagara region's got so much to offer. It's, uh, you know, there's just so much here that you really, really want those people to come back. Uh, the economic impact, uh, I've got some of the trim reports from 16 and 17. Um, it's between 25 and $29 million dollars that it brings to the community. That's not the plowing match itself, but that's the hotels, the restaurants, the gas stations, the grocery stores. So that's, that's a big impact in, in a community. So, uh, and most economic development people really light up about that because that's, that's bringing money to your area and that's, that's huge. So that's kind of a snapshot of it. Uh, I don't know whether you have questions or. Okay, thank you so much for that presentation and I'll see if uh, any council members have any questions for David. Alderman Conk. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, yes, thank you for the presentation. Is there um, anything that the, the host community has to contribute to the international plowing match? And if there is, can you tell us what that might be? Yeah, okay. As you realize, this, this is a $3 million show to put on. So if a community engages in this project, uh, you have to have money to start the project. So traditionally what's happened is each county, municipality are asked for $100,000 in seed money. And uh, that can be in two ways. Uh, a lot of times it's, it's a loan. You, you give the, uh, the group, the local group, that $100,000, that gets them started. And then they have to get out and fundraise the community, get corporate sponsorship and stuff. And then in 50% of the cases, the community, like your municipality would say, okay, here's your $100,000, but we want it back at the end of the day. Some, some municipalities are real generous and they'll say, here's a $100,000 grant. As long as you don't abuse it, it's there for the project. So that's how you start it. And as you, as you saw in there, we have some huge sponsors like Bank of Montreal is an exclusive sponsor. We don't allow any other banks to participate in the match. And that's not us, not the Ontario Plowmans. That's the uh, Bank of Montreal. They give us around $150,000 cash. And uh, we use Celebrate Ontario. And we just actually, our executive director went to the uh, Festival and Events Ontario uh, banquet, it was in Hamilton, I think last Friday, and the international plowing match was recognized as one of the top 100 events in Ontario, and there's 4,800 events that are in that race, so it's pretty pleasing to be told we're in that top 100. If I can continue, I've got one more question. So uh, I'm curious to know uh, what happens uh, for the, the acreage that gets plowed um, obviously, the farmer's not going to be able to plant and harvest a crop. Um, how does that help the farmer who's donating the land? For okay, the let me explain that. Uh, the, uh, the tented city and RV park area are taken probably late July. And so what we do is encourage the farmer involved to grow hay, which is not a real good word in this area and many areas in Ontario. but. You're, you can take, you know, if the weather's proper, you could get at least two crops of hay off, maybe three, before it's turned over to the, the tented city group. So, uh, and then we do pay, we pay a rental fee for the land. Uh, the tented city and RV park rental fee is one, the highest price. And then parking lots and plow fields are another price. And what we do is we have about we usually try to get about 300 acres of parking, and the reason we do that, we might not use all of it or half of it, but if we do get a rain event, 
then you know we move from field to field so we don't tear up the field real bad with parking cars. And then the plow fields, like again, everybody that participates compensated for it. So maybe not to the, the unfortunate part today is land rental rates, and I'm sure they're getting high down here too, are, uh, we're probably not at that point, but they're negotiable as well. So, so the, you know, but the farmer does get the ability to have his crop and we've been allowing wheat to be grown. And so you'd get your wheat crop off before it's turned over. So I don't know whether that answers your question or not. Any other questions from council members? Yep. Alderman Hassels? <coughs> yep. Um, it, it is sounds like a pretty big undertaking. And you were talking local groups that, uh, that need to sponsor this. Is that? Uh... Well, what they, there's always a sponsorship committee uh, that's got to go out and I, I don't want to be the one in that job because I hate coming to you and bugging you for money and other things. But if you've got big businesses like in the area that, that buy in, you know, they'll sometimes give you $100,000. or But you got to go and tap all sorts of businesses. Uh, whatever way you can get money out of the community, like, like here, not so much here, but wine country could be a big bonus for the area, you know, to get those wineries to come on board and support sort of thing. And then, like, I'm not sure what big businesses are around here, but that's, that's the other way you've got to pull that money in. Yeah. I, I guess my, my question more is who, who's going to kind of organize all that or who's going to kind of uh, take, take this on? And uh... Well, yeah, that's... Let me just explain the structure a little bit. Uh, the board that I sit on has nine members, and when you form a local committee, there's nine key members, so you would get a chair. That chair is the person that's really the, the leader of the, of the group. That's the person that needs to build that nine-member executive, and then underneath that nine-member executive, there's 57 committees. So each committee would have 10 subcommittees underneath them. But that main chair is really just the, the chair. And they, you know, they bat the balls back and forth and make it all, make it all happen. But that, the chair has to be somebody that can come to council and talk to you guys. You got to involve all the, the fire, health, all the social things that go on in a community all have to be abided by. Like, even you have to have a, a, a building permit for tents. So the building department gets involved and, you know, it's, there's a lot of interreaction and that's why it takes a couple of years to, to get it all together. And as I said earlier, you need about a thousand volunteers to make it happen, but you need those nine core people at the top and those nine core people at the top mirror the nine member provincial board. So last year, my responsibility was Tented City. So I tagged along with the guy from Tented City, that chair, to, uh, you know, to talk back and forth to support it. Because the Ontario Plowmen's Association owns the show, but the local community actually makes it happen. So uh, I don't know whether that's answered your question. Yeah, like for a community that's never hosted something this big, it, it seems like a really big undertaking, so I'm not sure how much help we're going to get. Well, yeah, it's it's challenging to, to get it together, and as I said to you, we have been looking at it in Holdem in a little bit, trying to get, get something together, and we're struggling right now trying to find that great person that would, could be the chair. Uh, because, and you know, there's, there's people out there that'll do it. Uh, the other downside problem is it's a volunteer position. So uh, we've had people step forward and say, well, we'll do it if we're paid. Well, we can't pay certain people and not 800 other people just volunteer. It's, it's a community betterment project and that's how you got to buy into it. So, and to me, you would want to take it to the greater Niagara region uh, the other thing that's, uh, we've got zones in uh, the Ontario Plowmans and the Niagara area, Haldeman, Norfolk, Brant, and Wentworth are a zone. And that could be a case that it could be a cooperative effort between a couple of the municipalities uh, as well. And that's, 
that's what we would like to see happen, and it's, it just hasn't. Uh, the one, one problem that I see is, you know, if it's in Waynefleet, well, are the people from Dunville going to come and help? You know, or whatever. That's, that's the, the one thing. And, you know, I've had people say to us, uh, well, there's no volunteers. And I don't know what your perception of that in this community is, but uh, I think there's, people are out there. It's just, you got to, you got to get them excited about it, and then they'll come and want to be involved. Like last year in, in 17 in Walton, I was at the uh, volunteer orientation day, and there was 1,700 people showed up at that event from the community who wanted to be involved. They had actually too many volunteers. They were sending people home because they didn't have anything for them to do. And that's a, that's a good problem, but, uh, you know, so, but it takes some really dynamic people to... Uh, to put it all together and make it happen. Okay, any other questions from council members? Okay, seeing none, I, I appreciate that you came down to present to us and that had been the discussion offline. I, I think the original, we'd received an email and then we would kind of had a loose discussion and then Alderman Hessels reached out to you, but staff had reached out to Niagara Region to make them aware that you were coming to present. And so, like I say, there's been kind of some loose discussion about what this might look like. So I think if, if it's left with us, we can, we can follow up with them and um, maybe talk to our neighboring municipalities and then kind of see where we land and then reach out to you again. Yeah, no, that's, we're totally open for further discussion. This is kind of an initial introduction yeah. and uh, you know, if, if you want other discussion, be it whatever, uh, we're here to, to help because we want to see this thing continue and move through Ontario. And, you know, it'd be really cool to have it down here. You've got hotels, you've got lots of stuff here that some places don't have. So, you know, there's, there's some pretty good advantages here, but it does take, does take some really dynamic people to to push it out the door sort of thing. So, but certainly we're open for discussion. I've got some bidding guidelines I could leave with Amber if you sure. want and just kind of lays out the, the protocol. So, and That's thank great. you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you. Okay, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Okay, so now we will uh, move on to my mayor's remarks. Um, so I'll start off by saying that we are very, very pleased to welcome our new CAO sitting to my left, uh, William Colossa, who comes from the town of Lincoln and brings with him many, many, many years of experience. So we're very grateful and glad that, uh, that you are here with us. I, when we sat down tonight, I thought, oh, it's weird. I have somebody sitting beside me. I'm not used to that. So welcome. We're all really happy that you're here. Um, and I attended the OGRA conference, the Ontario Good Roads Association conference in Toronto last weekend, and Alderman Hessels attended, and some staff uh, were there. And our operations supervisor, Ron Vandelar, received a long service award in recognition of his 33 years of service. So I think there was a picture sent out to council and staff, so congratulations to Ron. Um, yesterday, I had a site tour of Hotel du Shaver in, uh, in Thorold uh, with their executive director, so that was really good to, uh, to visit there and see the whole facility and what they do, and they're the only um, rehab center serving all of Niagara, so uh, um, they have some great, really great facilities, really great programs there. And Lee and I will be visiting the Garden House on Lakeshore Road tomorrow. It's a new uh, restaurant on Lakeshore Road near Bessie. Um, and that's part of our continued site visits with the local businesses. And the Waynefleet Library is offering some excellent programming for the upcoming March break, which isn't a surprise. They always offer all kinds of good stuff for the kids when they're on holidays. So tomorrow is the last day to register and they are near capacity and further information is available on their website and Facebook page. And Regional Council will meet on Thursday, March 22nd and our drainage open house will also be taking place that evening from 7 to 9 p.m. at the Firefighters Community Hall next door. The next NPCA board meeting will be on Monday, March 26th. Usually it's on Wednesdays, but um, because of the chair's uh, state of the region, they've moved it to the Monday before. And then our next regular meeting of council will be on Tuesday, March 27th. So I will now turn to our acting clerk for the minutes. 
Let the minutes of the regular meeting of council held on February 13th, 2018 be adopted as circulated. So I need a mover and a seconder for the minutes. Moved by Alderman Gilmore, seconded by Alderman Dykstra. Are there any errors or omissions on the minutes? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? And that is carried. And now we'll go on to our first staff report. That administrative staff report ASR 002-2018 regarding the temporary vacancy on council and the rec recommendations contained therein be adopted as circulated. So I need a mover and a seconder. Moved by Alderman Dykstra, seconded by Alderman Gilmore. Um, so are there any, so this report is back from the fall, I believe it was, early fall. Um, so are there any questions or comments from council members? Alderman Hassels. <clears throat> yeah, do, do we know how long your leave of absence is going to be? No, we do not. Okay. <clears throat> so I, I was just, if it's long term, I, I was just thinking or wondering if it might be good to, to split the NPCA. You have a, you need a delegate to go there too, if that might be something another uh, councillor would be interested in. I don't know if that leaves any issues or... Not that I'm aware of. I'm, I can't say for sure about the leave of absence, but I had been, it had been kind of looking at the end of April. So my guess was that that would only be one MPCA meeting that would be missed. Um, and you don't think you're going to win? <laughs> oh, you're talking for after. Yeah. Okay. Like, is there, so after the election, if you win, then you're, you're. Then, then, yeah, then yeah. it wouldn't be back. So. Okay. I thought, I'm sorry, I thought you were talking about the, the leading up to the election. Yeah, yeah, I know there's one. There's one basically every month, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So I think it's like the third, third or last Wednesday, it depends, of every month. Yeah, if it was just one month, I, I don't know if it, it would suit council, but I, I, I thought if it might be something that we uh, nominate another councillor to take care of the MPCA meetings. Sure, I don't, I don't like, know if uh, I'd look to, I don't know if I'd look to the clerk or the CAO to maybe comment on that, what that would look like, if that would come as an amendment to the report. Okay, so we could do that and amend the report so that it would be another, would you name that individual or you were? Well, I would nominate the individual. Okay. So do we okay. first have to? waive that or make the amendment or do I just nominate a person and go from there? Well, that I'm not 100% sure, so I'm going to look to the CAO. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, um, might I suggest that if in the event that your proposed amendment does not carry, um, then we're dealing with the original report. If you do have support for the amendment, then we can move on to uh, proceeding to nominating the alternate and then proceed back to the original motion as amended with the alternate considered at the same time. So, <coughs> so I'd make that amendment that we, uh, we uh, put another delegate as a uh, MPCA. Okay, so just so we're so you're gonna do that motion, I'm gonna get a seconder for that. If that passes, then we're going to choose that individual and then we go back to the main. Okay, so seconder for that motion, uh, seconded by Alderman Dykstra. Um, so any discussion on appointing a separate individual as the representative? Okay, um, seeing none, then I'll call the question. All those in favor? Okay, opposed if any? Okay, so that was three, right? We were, <laughs> all right, so that is carried. Yeah, I, I'd uh, nominate Richard or Alderman Dykstra. Okay. So that's a motion then to, okay. So we need a seconder for that. Okay, nobody's seconding that. <laughs> okay, so now we've got, see, I think the problem was that this has kind of come on the fly and this is what, unfortunately, like we've talked about doing these kind of motions on the fly and that's where we get into the notice of motion. And so, so now we've got, um, so now we've amended this, and then now we're not nominating anybody. So I'm looking, Alderman <laughs> Gilmore. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, mean, I have no problem with, uh, with naming a second person. I just, I'm just a little on, I guess, unclear. If, 
if you if you are going to miss some function, then as the mayor, you delegate one of us to attend. So, I I would think that if uh, Alderman Cox is going to be the acting mayor and she cannot go to something or chooses not to, then as the acting mayor, she can appoint one of us to possibly attend on her behalf. To me, that follows the protocol a little bit better than this. But that being said, I have no problem with Alderman Dykstra. If, if Alderman Conk is amenable to that, that's fine. But it just, it's a little bit uh, funky. I agree. I think we're, I think because we're in un, uncharted territory, because I don't think this has happened, I, I, not that any time that I'm aware of in, in, since Stan Pettit was mayor or what have you. So I, I think I see what you're saying. Alderman Hessels has kind of split up the duties. We have somebody go to the region, somebody go to the MPCA. I'm, I'm okay with that, but I think, I don't know if maybe we need time to think about this or just to do it on the fly tonight. Uh, I, I think, think I think, point of order, you need to have a seconder before you can even discuss this. Okay, a seconder to discuss, I think, okay, well, we're still, we're not talking about the person, I think we're talking more about the actual process, and we're back on this report, but, um, I made the motion okay. to do it, and we haven't had a seconder, so. All right. Okay, so you've made the motion, there's no seconder, so now we're back to an amended report. We're back to the original report. But it's amended to, am I correct? That we, yeah, so we amended it to um, send somebody. Madam Mayor, I would, uh, I would ask that we amend the report back to its original form, please. Okay, so is that a, a motion to, it's a good thing Will's here. <laughs> You're, through you, Madam Mayor, you're basically rescinding the original, the, the movement to do the amendment. So that is that is motion. Okay. That is standable. Okay. So so Alderman Dykstra is making that motion to rescind. So do we have a seconder to rescind, Alderman Hassel? So I'll call the question on rescinding. All those in favor? All right. So that's carried. So we're back to the original report. So is there any discussion then about? Um, so the motion is to have Alderman Conk be the acting mayor, go to the region, go to the MPCA. We're good. We're going to call the question. All right. All those in favor? And that's carried. Okay. So now we're going to move on. Um, actually, we... Oh, look at the timing. So Randy is here. We were just ready to ask leave of <coughs> council if we could uh, wait for that, but we'll give you a second to get seated. And I will very, very slowly look to Adam to read that report. The building staff report BSR 004 2018 regarding the summary of 2017 building permit activity and the recommendations contained therein be adopted as circulated. Mover and a seconder for this report moved by Alderman Conk, seconded by Alderman Gilmore. Um, any discussion or questions on this report? Alderman Conk? Yes, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with your math. <laughs> so, uh, you, you tell us that you had 211 permit applications and 185 permits issued. Uh, so, the difference between 211 and 185 is 26. So, were 26 refused outright? Is, is that what I'm inferring from that? Through you, Madam Mayor, to Alderman Conk. Uh, the 211 refers to the number of permits that actually came in. Yep. Of the 211 permits, um, 155 were for building permits alone, 55, 56 were for septic. Um, those are just the numbers that came in. They weren't actually the numbers that were issued. Right. That's where we move further into the report and we discuss that portion. Okay. But I'm, there's still a 26 difference. So were those refused? Were so the, they not completed? Of the 211? Yeah. They just weren't, there wasn't enough information to okay. actually issue those permits. Okay. So uh, for the benefit of the gallery, um, is there, how do you determine the value of a building permit? The, is it, three, is it based on the, the cost of the building that's going up? That is correct. Okay. And I know this probably sounds like a silly question, but... Um, were all of the, the home permits that were issued, 
Were they scattered across the township, or was there one particular area that, that we saw more building permits issued than any place else in the township? Through you, Madam Mayor, to Alderman Conk, uh, to be quite honest, uh, I think as far as density goes, the majority of them were probably built in the MEMI subdivision okay. <clears throat> or the applications, but the other ones were scattered throughout the community. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions from council members? All right, seeing none then, I will call the question. All those in favor? And that is carried. The building staff report BSR 005 2018 regarding the monthly statistical report and the recommendations contained therein be adopted as circulated. Uh, mover and seconder for that one, Alderman Dykstra and Alderman Gilmore. Um, any questions on this one? Uh, Alderman Hassel. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I think we're going to put some numbers up. <clears throat> Are you? We're just working on that. Did you want to speak to it, Randy, before I go to Alderman Hessels? So through you, Madam Mayor, to all council and uh, the public, general public, there were errors in the uh, initial report that have since been corrected, and you all have a copy of that in front of you. We also have a copy of the re revised uh, January figures uh, on the overhead above. Okay, thank you. Alderman Hessels, you <coughs> have the floor. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah this, um, this value of construction of uh, 1.3 million for the um, addition to the arena condition, and then you also have an addition to the arena condition of 3,500. Could you uh, <coughs> give us a little, uh, what that's all about there, or what's all those permits were for? <coughs> Through you, Madam Mayor, to Alderman Hessels. So the, the two permits that are at question are for the Township of Wayne Fleet themselves. One was for the, um, the addition to the vestibule and the internal uh, renovations to the arena, as well as the addition to the arena off the back for the new change rooms. Um, both permits were unable to be issued because they hadn't received MOECC clearance. So as uh, part of the process, that has to come in prior to the permits being issued. But we have the option to issue a conditional permit, um, which we, we did for both uh, purposes. And uh, but we, then we were finally allowed to, or, be, or we were able to include the total fees for the cost of construction and the second to last column under value of construction, and then corresponding to the, uh, those figures, then the column to the right are the actual fee for the conditional permits. We've since received uh, the MOECC clearance, so we're gonna actually go ahead and be able to have issued the actual permits for those projects. <clears throat> if I may continue. So is there gonna be another permit <coughs> coming to us for the septic system then? Uh, that is correct. Will be another one. Yes, sir. Okay, any other questions from council members? Okay, seeing none, so I'll call the question um, on the report. All those in favor? And that is carried. Now we'll go on to the next one. That bylaw enforcement staff report BESR 004 2018 regarding the exotic animal bylaw and the recommendations contained therein be adopted as amended for consideration at the March 27th, 2018 meeting of council. I need a mover and a seconder for this one. Moved by Alderman Hassel, seconded by Alderman Gilmore. Any questions or discussion on this one? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? And that is carried.
The bylaw enforcement staff report BSR 005 2018 regarding new parking bylaw and the recommendations contained therein be adopted as circulated. Um, mover and a seconder, moved by Alderman Dykstra, second by Alderman Conk. Um, any questions on this one? Alderman Hessels. <coughs> yeah. um, maybe the bylaw officer can, can kind of, and I, I did get an email today on parking again, so. <clears throat> Maybe he can just tell us what's really the the nuts and bolts, or yeah, he is sure. So, uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to Alderman uh, Hessels, through the original bylaw that we're using uh, was adopted from the region. Um, so the, there's a lot of sections in there that really aren't applicable to to a township uh, of this size. Uh, so we've just cleaned up a lot of those. Uh, sections um, you know we don't need taxi cab stands and uh, uh, bus bus areas angled parking uh, things like that um, uh, metered parking uh, was removed um, um, we've added some um, emergency route sections uh, for firefighters to gain access to water at the quarry for uh, if by chance there's issues down there. Um, we've included safety precautions for that. Um, we have I've been adding um, five accessible uh, parking spaces down by Reeves Bay Beach. Um, our, our own municipal lots are now included in, in the parking bylaw as well. Okay, uh, Alderman Dykstra. <coughs> uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Mark, um, you are suggesting that you've added five accessible parking lot spaces. Is that an addition to what was there, or did you re remove the five from the existing parking spaces that were there? Uh, three, Madam Mayor, two, Alderman Dykstra. There was uh, estimated, I believe, 28 spots in that Reeves Bay Beach area. Five have been reallocated to be um, accessible parking, and um, they are closest to a boardwalk going down to the beach. Um, if I may continue, yeah, that's great that we have more accessibility parking spaces, but the problem that I have is I'm strongly against in any tighter parking along that area until we decide to start creating more spaces. In fact, we are taking, again, more spaces away or people that want access to the lake, especially in the summertime, where it's, we all get emails as soon as the summer comes that people want to go to the beach and there's no place to go. Everywhere they used to go, they're getting ticketed and ticketed and ticketed. So did we increase any spaces or did we just take away? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to Alderman Dykstra. As of right now, um, there's just five spaces uh, that are designated for accessible parking. Um, along Maplewood and Woodlawn, we cannot right now um, implement a residential parking permit because the roads are not wide enough. Uh, we cannot get, if vehicles are parked on that road, we cannot get emergency vehicles down that road. Um, there is a section in this bylaw for permit parking and is just left blank for future use. I have been in discussions with uh, the manager of operations. Those two roads are on his list to in the next uh, year or so to uh, be widened uh, because they are too small. If I may continue. And the area at the quarry where the dry hydrant is for the fire department, again, there's spaces removed there then as well? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to Alderman Dykstra. No, there's not. Uh, last year, um, at the beginning of summer, sorry, summer of 2016, uh, a report was brought through by operations to make all of Quarry Road no parking and Woodlawn and Maplewood no parking as well. So it's already no parking. Just that one spot where that dry hydrant is, is we're calling it now an emergency route and the fine will be equivalent to um, a city's fire route parking. And if I may continue one last comment. So you also, that, that's great. You also mentioned permit parking. Then this is a part of this that's left open. So you have an area that you have in mind to create permit parking However, it's not been created yet. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to Alderman Dykstra, that's absolutely correct. 
we have two areas that we're looking at for uh, residential permit parking, uh, but we can't do anything until those two roads are widened. Um, and I've been in discussions, uh, Quarry Road on both sides are also bike lanes, so we just have to figure out the legislation to allow parking maybe on one side of Quarry Road. Could you clarify residential parking? You mean residential for the, for the, the residences that are in the area only, not visitors to the lake, correct? I think, Madam Mayor, that is absolutely correct. Uh, you have the way the wording is going to be in the bylaw when we do amend this bylaw to include that. Uh, you will have to show proof of residency in the area, and we will allow to my my. Again, this is all preliminary. Um, my my thinking of it is two two permits per residential property. Uh, and then it'll be first come, first serve, who's ever allowed to park there. So if uh, a resident in the area has an extra car and then they have a guest, they can, they can all be in front of their house if they so choose. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman Hassel. <coughs> yeah. um, <coughs> Quarry Road, uh, and, and I'm not sure, we, I did get an email today. It sounds like there's a lot of room on the, on the west side of <coughs> the road, I guess, going up to Highway 3, and it, and that's no parking. Is is there a reason for that? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to Alderman Hessels. Um, is, is, that was done before I got here. I'm not sure of the whole reasoning behind it. I, in talks with operations, um, it has to do with something that it's been designated bike lanes on both sides, and that's why there is no parking instituted on those both those sides. So we just have to figure out uh, legislation and if there's any way we can accommodate both. Other questions? Alderman Dexter for a second time. Through you, Madam Mayor. Um, Mark, kind of like what Alderman Hessel said, have, have we looked at, I mean, many of our side roads that end at a fire road at the lake have no parking on both ends for a long, long way. Is there no way we can have parking on one side so that is it is there a reason that has to be no parking on both sides? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to Alderman Dykstra. Um, I'd have to consult with uh, Richard about this, uh, our operations manager. Um, I just went with what was currently in the bylaw for what we had for no parking. Uh, and there are areas that we, further down the road, we can, um, on some of those side roads, uh, as long as operations doesn't have any issues with it and we meet all our set required setbacks for roads and bike lanes or whatever the case may be, um, I would have no problem looking at uh, putting in, taking off no parking in certain areas to allow for more residential or uh, beach parking. Okay, thank you. So Will's just saying we can we can look at that like the staff can look at that and then come back. This is a question for you, Madam Mayor, or possibly will. Then I was gonna suggest that, could we look at that and how do we request that maybe operations department and bylaw work together? I don't mean to be picking on our bylaw officer, but I understand people want access to our beautiful beach and rightfully so, there is no parking. People have parked there. I was taken down there after doing hay for as a kid to go swimming and we're not allowing anybody to park anywhere near there and I understand we have to have ve emergency vehicles and bike lanes and whatnot but I, I think there's a way that we can get creative if we could just get maybe the operations department involved. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, um, just based on the discussion I'm hearing, uh, staff can take that as direction to go back and do some further analysis to see if there are locations where we can uh, either expand or, or, or pull back on the new parking issues. Um, so we will do that um, in consultation with uh, works, uh, with, with the region, with, with fire, with EMS, uh, all, all the appropriate agencies so that uh, things are done appropriately. Thank you. Okay. All right. So if there aren't any other uh, questions, then I will call the question. All those in favor? And that is carried. Um, so now we're on to the fire staff reports.
That fire staff report FSR 001 2018 regarding the deputy chief position and the recommendations contained therein be adopted as circulated. Uh, so I need a mover and a seconder for this one. Moved by Alderman Gilmore, seconded by Alderman Dykstra. And now I will look to the chief to do a presentation for us tonight. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, at last council meeting, I was asked to uh, provide clarification to council on the need for a deputy chief's position within uh, Wayne Fleet Fire Department. So uh, I provided that through council report and I just wanna go through some of the highlights of, uh, of that report. So the, the, the primary um, and predominant legislation that, that impacts the fire department is the Fire Protection and Prevention Act. So it lays out uh, what municipalities must provide within uh, their community. So, and I'll just go through these points. Every municipality shall provide public education on uh, fire safety. Certain components of fire prevention have to act upon uh, complaints and requests from the public for uh, fire safety um, within their homes or businesses. And uh, fire suppression services. So those services are dictated by um, the council, as far as the uh, the mandate goes, and what the community um, is, what is appropriate within the community to provide for its residents and and, uh, and traveling public. So the municipality, if you've established a fire department, must appoint a fire chief for the fire department, and the fire chief is the person that's ultimately responsible to council uh, for the delivery of the fire protection services. The Ontario Fire Marshal and Emergency Management uh, Office, the OFM, commonly referred to, provided some direction. There was a uh, complaint that uh, went in to the Ontario Fire Marshal's Office from the regional fire departments. It was a few couple of years ago, and it was regarding the ability of Waynefleet Fire to provide mutual aid services to other municipalities within the region. So there were a number of things that were uh, referred to. And some of the recommendations came from the fire marshal's office uh, are included in this list, including uh, reviewing the recommendations of the Dillon report, which is, um, the report itself is very lengthy and uh, I'm still working through that report at this point in time, uh, since the time I've been here. We uh, were also re required to uh, provide uh, incident management system training in the 100 level and 200 level. That's uh, already been completed for uh, city staff, but not for fire department personnel. So my intent is to um, ensure that we are covered by having all the firefighters take the 100 course, which is uh, can be done online. The 200 course is something that has to be delivered. Normally it's delivered in a day and a half. For, for volunteer firefighters, it's really not realistic to do that in some cases because of the work that they do uh, in the daytime and their home life. So we may have to split that up to a number of different uh, sessions that we have with them. There's a provincial test at the end of that and they get provincial certification for that. We were also directed to explore training opportunities with neighboring departments. So we have yet to do uh, that on a, on a widespread basis. We are going to other municipalities such as Fort Erie who has a uh, fire training tower to do some fire training with them, but it's not a joint training session, so, so to speak. It's more of uh, use of their facilities. And uh, in the future, we do intend to, uh, to partner more with our most common mutual aid partners in particular, which would be Pelham, Port Colburn, um, and uh, Haldeman. They were critical of our organization of training records and the, and the maintenance of the training records. And so uh, historically, if we had to look into a firefighter's file and come up with um, a history of all the training that they did, the files were quite light. They still are. Um, as far as reflecting the actual training that the firefighter was involved in, that becomes extremely problematic because if we don't have records of any training that we did, in the eyes of um, the Ministry of Labor or anyone else that comes in to take a look at our files, that training never happened. So it puts us in a position of liability and uh, that's unacceptable to be able to go out into the field and operate in dangerous environments, which we do. So we're working diligently at that. 
Um, they also mandated we have an analysis of our training response attendance on an ongoing basis to ensure that each firefighter is compliant with the minimum amount of training that is required and the minimum amount of uh, responses that are required. The training is quite obvious. You need to uh, have a certain amount of training per person. The responses are important also so that the firefighters get exposed to the actual responses and become very familiar working together so they can operate as a team on a fire ground or any emergency scene. We have to complete our operational uh, standard operating guidelines and provide ongoing training with those. That's something that I have yet to be able to get to, that I'm still working at trying to, uh, um, trying to get to so that we can provide each firefighter with their own set of operational guidelines, make sure that they're compliant with um, the legislation that's appropriate, which includes the public fire safety guidelines from the fire marshal's office, the uh, Ontario Health and Safety Section 21 guidelines, and, uh, and other legislation that impact um, our standards, such as the National Fire Protection Association standards. We were also directed to review and update a simplified risk assessment, and that looks at uh, your own municipality and what risks you have within the municipality, and uh, you have to provide for those risks in, um, in response guidelines and, and your training uh, in particular, so that you're training to the type of risk that you have in your municipality. And that sometimes changes, um, but most of the time, your simplified risk assessment will just need to be modified um, uh, on an annual basis. We have to provide a report to council, council to establish the levels of service for fire protection services and programs, and we'll be doing that through updating our establishing and regulating bylaw. And that will include um, our fire protection uh, response capabilities, as well as our um, motor vehicle accident response capabilities, and uh, medical and th things like that so that council is aware and can uh, um, approve all the things that we're involved in within the community. In addition to those, um, the Fire Protection and Prevention Act, we also have to comply with the um, Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act that governs how the municipality responds to larger scale emergencies. We've already begun that, as I stated, by uh, doing some introductory training with uh, the incident management system courses for our staff. All the building staff have been um, certified to IMS 100 and 200 as well. Uh, two additional staff were sent to take the basic emergency management course and the community emergency management coordinators course. And that would be um, um, something that's required for alternates to the primary CEMC, which is myself. So the other piece of legislation is the Occupational Health and Safety Act, as I referred to in the report. And although, as I uh, indicated, every uh, operation has to comply with health and safety guidelines, the one in particular that seems to be used on fire departments, and I've, before I was even in the fire department, I worked for um, the region of Halton in their, um, in their municipal services division, and uh, was a health and safety rep there. I was a joint health and, health and safety co-chair within uh, my previous job for many years. And every time we got a visit from the Ministry uh, of Labor, they brought out their book and they, they referred to 25-2H, which means that the uh, employer must take all reasonable steps for the protection of their workers. Because within the fire department, there are many unique uh, um, activities that we have to be involved in. And they're not generally uh, coined directly within the legislative requirements, so the catch-all is used on the fire department all the time. So those are things that, uh, that dictate how we operate and what we have to uh, comply with. So the fire uh, department workload in Wayne Fleet includes uh, also, in addition to those things that, that were already mentioned, um, equipment review and assessment including repairs and replacements. In many cases, we have outdated equipment. We're trying to update some of those things now and, and doing a review of them. We're looking at making sure we have a listing of all of our equipment so that we know when they're going to be able to be replaced so that we can um, inform our, our capital project needs for the future. Emergency management programs and bylaws, that's something that's upcoming. It's going to take me probably, I would say, uh, a month or so to, uh, uh, to do this, which includes bylaw writing, um, program committee 
uh, creation and meetings, rewriting the emergency plan, creating standard operating guidelines for each of the positions, position descriptions, emergency operations center layout, displays, communications, and facilitate the annual exercises. As a min At a minimum, you have to have one a year. And as we're growing and kind of relatively new at this uh, with new staff, uh, we'll probably try and exercise a little bit more frequently, especially in the early stages within the first couple of years. The Ontario Fire Marshal's Office and Emergency Management has recently adopted a new fire service professionalization and they've taken on the National Fire Protection Association standards, which is really not only in North America wide, but pretty much becoming worldwide um, uh, standards that people and fire departments and municipalities will comply with. So the, some of the categories are our firefighters um, with firefighter one and two and fire inspectors. There's a number of different positions that are identified here. In particular, what we're looking at trying to do is train to firefighter one and two with our existing staff. And uh, there are going to be courses that are, are uh, taking place right after we complete our medical training, which is ongoing at this time. When we get our recruit class coming in, they'll be taking a similar type of uh, training. At the end of that training, we'll write provincial exams, which will give us um, Ontario certification again. So we can put those in our files and feel comfortable moving forward. And that is the minimum requirement that the province expects us to participate with. Um, for firefighting and, uh, and rescues. So there's also um, a mutual aid plan that we're uh, looking at trying to enhance some of the responses within uh, the Niagara region. Although every municipality doesn't have a hazardous materials team, for example, we're required to train to a certain level within hazardous materials, not necessarily to buy uh, level A suits and go into hazardous material environments and do rescues and damming and diking and things like that. But we have to train to a, um, uh, an operations core level, is what they call it, which will allow us then to utilize the resources that are found within other larger municipalities within the region and bring them into our community. So as part of their requirements for them to be able to reach out and come into Wayne Fleet to help us for our hazardous materials calls, we have to have a certain level of training. So, and we haven't got, we have a few people with that, but not very many, and we're going to, um, have to uh, train to the uh, awareness and ops level for that. So we have to also make sure that we have those standard operating guidelines that I mentioned before. We have to implement those and have ongoing review and revisions, again, to the NFPA standards, Section 21 guidelines, and uh, the, the Fire Marshal's Public Fire Safety Guidelines. Uh, I've also been asked to organize and implement uh, Safety Day, which, um, you know, is another uh, task that we have. Uh, I, the other day we had someone drop off all of the, uh, the finances for safety day from the past and identify that we're behind the eight ball right now with trying to get that day organized that most of the time uh, it should have already been started well into last year so that we could um, uh, prepare for it. So we're getting together uh, as an officers group and we're talking about how we can alter that day somewhat but still come uh, uh, up with a uh, um, with a safety day that the public will benefit from. We have to maintain oversight and assistance of our inspection program and our public education program. We have a firefighter uh, on staff that, um, as a volunteer, that um, participates in, in some of those uh, inspections. He's not a, fire, a certified fire prevention officer, but is willing to um, um, at least uh, participate in uh, investigating those initial calls, bring them to our attention so that we can uh, have further, more complex inspections take place. We have to create and maintain a fire department stores area. Uh, one of the things that I found when I, when I came here was that our store or stock of different supplies was all over the place. And uh, we're trying to get those together, but what we also need is one main stores area so that we can have spares of different things that we can draw upon, know what our stock level is so that we can reorder before we get down to zero. Right now, we're just kind of doing it on an ad hoc basis and it doesn't really work very well because someone's always wanting, uh, when they ask for something, they're wanting something, we can't provide it to them until we go ahead and order again. And uh, that's really not a good way to do business. So one good thing that's uh, come up is firefighter grandfathering, and that's a provincial certification equivalency that we can achieve with some of our firefighters if they have the appropriate experience level or education level, we can apply to the province for them to 
um, to achieve a certain level. So again, this revolves back around to our filing systems and our record keeping. And if we don't have good record keeping and we can't identify that we had staff that attended um, training sessions and they don't have any record of it, then we can't get that grandfathering through um, the certification and knowledge-based portion. So we're still looking at trying to do that as much as we can with our staff to take advantage of this, but it's a difficult uh, task and I've, uh, I've struck a committee to help uh, myself work with that. So we're trying to go through the files and organize them so that we can easily assess each one for uh, the applicability for the firefighter grandfathering. Ongoing certifications, as I mentioned before, with the professionalization, we have to make sure that we're meeting that with certain things. For example, pump operators. We have a, um, a number of firefighters that are pump operators. As, a cert as of a certain date, they have to have certification. Um, so anybody that wasn't able to be grandfathered, and we have a fairly large number of younger uh, firefighters. If anyone started after 2010, then they are ineligible for grandfathering. Um, and that's just the way that, that, that it was set up. They had to be on the department for a certain number of years before they were eligible for that. So in all likelihood, we're gonna have to hold courses to certify um, those people who will be operating uh, fire engines or pumps uh, in the future. So it's another uh, task that we have to go through um, training for and then bring in certify our certified testers from the province to, uh, to test us. And uh, the good, another good thing, but uh, it, it takes work that we're working on uh, trying to accomplish is uh, getting the annual banquet organized and uh, award ceremony for uh, 2018. Historically, I know that um, you know, a points night for firefighters is, is a great night to have, but um, a banquet is really what we ought to be having um, so that the municipality can adequately and properly thank the firefighters for the service that they're providing. And um, this will be happening in November, and this council will be invited to that uh, banquet as well. The last thing that I have on this work, workload list is interior firefighting. And I know I have talked to a number of people within Wayne Fleet, some do know and others don't know, that we do not perform interior firefighting and rescue within Wayne Fleet. So the fire department can only provide defensive services at this point in time. It's called limited interior work, and I'll, I'll just explain that a little bit. If someone has a, a pot on the stove fire in their home uh, and the fire is pretty much contained to that area of the kitchen, we can come in and investigate um, and then do a fast attack on that fire, put it out. If a room becomes uh, involved in fire, even if it's one fully involved room and it becomes a structure fire, the firefighters have to back out at that point. We cannot be in the, the building at that point. So until we can uh, get ourselves back in qualified, and that's up to me to determine at this point, um, we are only going to be doing limited interior. I have an aggressive plan to try and get us back into doing that, but right now we are doing limited interior um, fire suppression activities. And again, the public needs to know that as well as uh, council so that you understand where we're at right now. Uh, that was one of the issues that the mutual aid uh, complaints came about from the other fire departments within the Niagara region. So if we call someone out into the Wayne Fleet for, to help us with our firefighting needs, we can only ask them to do what we can do ourselves. So I can't call on our neighboring municipalities and say, you guys go into that building. We're only gonna ask them to do, and we only can ask them to do what we can do ourselves under mutual aid. And the same thing in reciprocation to those other municipalities, we're not as useful to them as the other municipalities around. If they call on us and they want us to go inside a building to help fight a fire, we can't do that currently. So I just wanted you to know that. We have an aggressive plan to try and get back into that uh, um, uh, level of service, but right now we're not there. And the things that I've just mentioned to you are a lot of the reasons that I'm asking you to support hiring the deputy chief's position. And uh, if I, you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, take them. Okay, thank you for that presentation. Are there any uh, questions from council members? Alderman Hassels? Yeah. Um, when, when you did ask for it in the budget, I, I kind of remember you, you said you couldn't get a fire prevention officer. But we did have a fire prevention officer. I know he didn't last too long, but then I believe when you can't find one, you, you need to go externally. Did that happen? 
Um, through the chair to Alderman, uh, Councillor Alderman Hessels, uh, we, I wasn't here at the time, but my understanding was that uh, every one of the, I think there were five applicants that were interviewed for the position, were offered the position, and um, only one accepted and then left the position within, um, I think it was five days, uh, because they found more acceptable employment. Yeah. Now, but, but that's going right. outside at that point in time, I think that that was the beginning of um, what happened with the last fire chief and his exit from uh, the municipality. Yeah. But <clears throat> if, I, if I look at the, the consultant's report to the Dillon's consultant's report, there, there was no, no talk about a deputy chief. There were other positions in the department that should be filled, and, and I don't believe they are filled to this day. And, and if they were filled, would that relieve a lot of the uh, extra work that, that's put on you, I would? Um, through the chair, what positions in particular? Are well, I think yeah, in the thing you needed a couple platoon chiefs and four captains, like, like those positions. I, I don't think they're filled yet, and if, and that was one thing that was in the report was fill up these positions, and what I'm saying, there was no talk about looking at a deputy fire chief, so we're, we're going way in, a, we're skipping a, a portion in it, and you're jumping over to get this deputy fire chief, so I, that's why I'm wondering if you had all the people in place, would that help? Through the chair, one of the reasons that we don't have the people in place are because we don't have the level of management uh, capability that with the, the depth. And uh, again, as I mentioned before, I don't criticize the previous chiefs that were in position. I know what they were up against and I feel exactly the same way. I'm keeping my head above water right now trying to get things working, but I can't do much else other than that. I can't be strategic. I can't be as beneficial to the community as I would like to be, as you expect me to be, unless I'm able to get a little bit more free time to be able to do things. So the positions uh, and many of the things that I've identified up here on the, uh, on the screen are things that are really management-driven um, operations and oversight. And we haven't got those other positions in place. There's a couple of reasons for that. We have a relatively young department, some of our lieutenants. So we have firefighters, lieutenants, captains, platoon chief, and then chief. The deputy chief would fall between the platoon chief position and the chief's position. And we have at least four of those uh, senior positions that are vacant right now. There's a, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is to, uh, because we need to provide additional um, senior level training. And um, I'd love to be doing that right now, but um, I haven't been able to do that. The other thing is um, we have a young department and we need to get more experience to get those people into those places. So um, it leaves us with a gap, and, um, and we have uh, to deal with this position in particular tonight before we can even start to identify whether we'll have positions that we need to fill or not. If the deputy comes from within, then that will be another vacancy that we need to fill, and we'll go about filling those, um, but we have to provide some training as we go along to do that. If I may continue. Like, it, it sounds like... <laughs> A lot of stuff hasn't been done, record keeping and all that. So this deputy chief, are, are you looking at it as a long term or as a fill in just till you get caught up with all this? Because that's the scariest thing about putting in a deputy chief. I, I think once you have it in there, you can't go back. But you're saying that you got a lot of catching up to do. So once the catching up is done, is there a need for the deputy chief after that? Through the chair. This position and, and managing the fire department isn't a one-time thing where you basically get over the hump and then you're fine and you can do smooth sailing. You have to stay at it. You have to keep on managing the, part, the department and taking care of um, the new legislation that comes out, the new training needs that come out. Our firefighters don't last as long as they used to. We have to continually deal with uh, the advertising for new firefighters. We can do a much better job at that as well um, and, and reaching out into the community to try and find um, more suitable, not more suitable, but additional suitable applicants that can come forward. And that might even start in the public school system in providing uh, knowledge for them to, uh, um, to look to the future as a, as a volunteer firefighting career. But definitely, um, this is a long-term game. So if I may continue, like you had the, the price tag of around 90000 
So will this deputy chief need a vehicle too? Like, I, I'm afraid this 90,000 is going to end up being well over 100 by the time we're done. I, so I don't know if you can address that. Through the chair, the, um, the wage that was set for it was based on um, the, um, the general practice throughout the province. I contacted the Ontario Association of Fire Chiefs and uh, they gave the rule of thumb, which was identified in the, uh, uh, in the document. It also met with uh, um, our HR um, uh, hiring practices or, or our HR practices for uh, positions that was evaluated. And, uh, and so in comparison to, uh, to other municipalities, um, it certainly falls within what is considered uh, average. And I know that it's probably even below that. And um, there are other municipalities also that, that pay in accordance with a first-class firefighter's rate within the province for full-time uh, positions that they hire. And the current full-time position, I believe, for a first-class firefighter right now is about $98,000. And some of the positions in the local area use a 10% increase above that to pay their deputy chiefs. Okay, any other questions from council members? Alderman Dykstra. Through you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Chief, for the report. Um, it's very informative. However, um, just in, in your, some of your responses to Alderman Hessels, when he asked about the officers' positions being filled, you, you said uh, we don't have the depth in our, our fire department or the level of management capability there to possibly, with a junior fire department, to fill those positions. I just don't understand how, if we don't have that level, how we would have somebody internally capable of being a deputy chief. I, I, just, can you explain that? Through the chair, we, we do have people that have capability that I believe would be suitable for the position. However, as a whole, we have a relatively young department. So in our positions, in uh, lieutenant's positions, for example, most of those positions have only been held for less than a year. If I may continue. So then what we would be doing would be, we'd be removing one of the senior people that would likely get the job. And we're gonna have a, nobody, who, who, who's, ne who's gonna replace that position if we have a lot, these many junior people? I mean, I don't know whether we're limiting ourselves just by doing an internal posting. I understand what we're doing. It's always nice to have up and coming from within, but if we really don't have that depth there, I don't want to. I don't want to limit the municipality to not look at. Maybe we need to look outside or look further. I, I, I just. I know. I know the, the, the makeup of the fire department, and I know we have a lot of. Thank goodness, a lot of young up and coming, um, great firefighters. But I understand they don't have the years of service or the experience or the training. So I'm just wondering if we're limiting ourselves by just doing an internal posting? Uh, through the chair, I personally believe uh, and I have confidence in our department that we can provide that uh, position from within our department. And I believe we have people that can fill that role. Um, I will be mentoring them as we go along. And I think, um, you know, along with, with that, we're going to have a, a very capable person in the end when we select them. If by any chance, through the hiring process and the committee. The committee determines at the end of the interview process, we don't have any suitable uh, applicants. We will not choose somebody just because we have to. We'll go outside and, and uh, use the external process at that point in time. But I certainly want to give our own firefighters the first shot at it. And I think I owe it to our own department to do that. Um, one last comment, Madam Mayor. Um, as well as many of the uh, vacancy items that, or a lot of the items that need to be dealt with that are taking your time, understandably so, but many of these are because of the vacancy of our fire prevention officer. Many of these duties would fall on them. Is that not correct? Like the vacancy, we, have, we don't have a fire prevention officer here right now. So I know we've kind of rolled it into two-part fire prevention and deputy. But if we had the fire prevention person, many of these duties would have being dealt with? Through the chair, the, the majority of what I've put up here, if not all of it, deals with 
the management duties that I would be looking at assistance uh, from a deputy chief to deal with. The fire prevention part of it is given, and I don't think we, I didn't think we needed to um, relay the need for that, so I left it right out. This is in addition to the fire prevention duties that would be required of that position. Uh, one more, one last comment, Madam Mayor. Um, Chief, as well, if we have a applicant that's suitable for the position within the fire department, they would come without any further training because I mean, I, the ninety thousand dollars is the wage, but what about the training aspect? Are we looking at another twenty, thirty? Like, what kind of training dollar are we going to put on this position? Through the chair, uh, the officer training that needs to be provided for any position, I can personally deliver the training myself with very little cost. I've been qualified by the province to not only teach the firefighter one, two, the fire officer one, two, but also fire officer three, and the highest level is a fire officer four. So generally that's for urban um, departments. Fire officer three, I recently got qualified in, so I can teach all of those within, according to the, uh, the time constraints that our uh, volunteers have. So my intent is to try and get, as mu get through as much of that training as I can once we get through the firefighter one and two, bring everyone that I can along to, f to fire officer one and two within the time that I have available here. Thank you. Sorry, okay. just to add to sure. that, um, there is some external training and I would estimate it probably was, it will be within $1,000. And that would be for pretty much any applicant that we got, we would have to try and make sure that they fit into the design that we chose. Okay, any further questions from council? I'll just look around before we go to Alderman Hassels for a second time. So I will go to Alderman Conk. Oh, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, in your report, Chief, um, under methods of providing services, I've highlighted um, You've got A, appoint a community fire safety officer or a community fire safety team. What would that look like? So, excuse me, uh, through the chair. We, we all already have established a fire department, so these other options are primarily um, put into legislation to address unorganized communities in the far north. Okay. All right, so, <clears throat> to be honest, I'm really torn here. Um, I understand that you're between a rock and a hard place when it comes to um, the lack of organizational, operational um, things that you're dealing with um, because the <clears throat> department's been in disarray for quite a while. Um, and we all know that, and that's, that's part of, that fault lies with council, I believe. And so I must apologize on behalf of council to the, to the community for that. Um, we've made some, some errors in, in judgment, I believe. So here we are. And, and like um, Alderman Hessels ask, uh, once we have a deputy fire chief um, in, in position, that's not ever going to go away because those duties of the, uh, of the deputy are going to remain. And you've listed them here. They're, they're quite extensive. And, and then we had yours on top as, as the fire chief. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I mean, Waynefleet doesn't have as much money as other municipalities do when it comes to the budget. And, and um, that's, that's a large concern of mine is, is where on earth are we going to continue to get $90,000 a year to pay for a deputy fire chief and then a fire chief? and then a fire prevention officer, I, I get that, that you're suggesting that the fire prevention officer be rolled into the deputy fire chief. However, looking at some of the, the things that are coming down from the fire marshal's office in the province, um, we might not be able to do that. So again, um, I understand where you're coming from. I, I get it, you, you're, the workload is, is horrendous. But at the end of the day, I, I don't know that I can support this position um, without exploring um, potentially filling um, those other um, platoon chiefs and, and whatnot from within and, and putting a fire prevention officer in place first. Is that, is that 
out of the realm of possibilities to do, or, or is it just stupid? Through the chair, I, um, I'm really cautious, as I mentioned in the report, about um, adding additional workload onto the volunteer firefighters' requirements. They have certain minimums that they have to uh, meet. That's what the, um, the attendance issues that we have to address. We have a significant number of volunteer firefighters that are below the minimum level that I have to now go out and meet with and talk to them about what their problem is. If they can't resolve that, we're supposed to get rid of these firefighters and say, you're no longer going to be a, vo a volunteer firefighter in Waynefleet. I don't want to be the tipping point, adding additional, resor or additional responsibilities on the shoulders of the firefighters. I want them to train. I want them to be uh, engaged in coming in training and attending as many possible calls as, as we can. Our numbers are at 35 right now. I, I said operationally possibly a little bit less because we have some who really aren't participating much anymore. We have a recruit class right now of 11, and that may go down because normally you have people drop off through the recruitment process. And if we end up back with 35 to 40 people, Dylan recommended uh, for, uh, 60 people, and we're at 40. We're still not where we really need to be. So we need every single person that we can get to be contributing to those fire scenes. And um, just to answer a previous question about taking um, a firefighter out of the firefighting ranks to make a deputy chief, I'm responding right now. I'm part of that response. That person won't change. They will still be part of that response when they go out. And I will just say one extra thing, and that is that a, f a house fire in Waynefleet is no different than a house fire anywhere else in this province. It's just as important that we have the boots, the gloves, the helmets, the balaclavas, the, the, the protective gear, and uh, the procedures all in place and down pat, because it, when the, um, when the uh, requirements are for us to do all those things, it's no different in any other municipality, and we'll be held to the same standard as someone in, in Toronto. So, so can you tell me um, if we had um, a de if we go ahead and, and approve your request for a deputy fire chief, how long is it going to take both you and the and the deputy fire chief to get where we need to be with regards to um, all the documentation being in place, all the training being uh, done and in place? Um, all of the house cleaning and housekeeping um, issues that you've, you've talked about in your report. How can you give us a, a timeline on when you would expect all of that to be completed? Through the chair, I, my thought on it is, and I can't give you an exact time because there are many variables that yep. play into it, but in 2019, I want to be back to being able to uh, do interior firefighting. So I, I just have one more question. So um, should we not have a deputy fire chief and something were to happen, one of our firefighters was to be gravely injured attending a fire, um, what would happen from the perspective of the Ontario Fire Marshal's office to, to the township? What could happen? Through the chair, right now um, the fire marshal's office would do a review and that's whether or not we have a deputy chief or whether we don't have a deputy chief. If we have an injury, whether it's a firefighter injury, uh, especially if it's a critical injury um, or there's an investigation or an inquest based on a, a, a member of the public that, uh, that has a, a, um, a significant injury or death, um, there would be the, uh, the coroner that would come in and do an investigation and make recommendations. The fire marshal's office would do a review of the fire department operations to determine whether they were sufficient or not and whether we have the records and all that. The Ministry of Labor would be called in if it was one of our own uh, that was injured or uh, killed, had a significant injury or death. And, uh, and they would hold us accountable for that. So the municipality would be held accountable for liability and that could be um, you know, significant uh, cost to the municipality. The council, to my understanding, is protected. Um, however, the fire chief's position is not as protected. And that's one thing that really bothers me because I know right now we're not where we should be. So okay. holding us back from going inside is something that I really don't approve of. I don't think it's what we, the uh, public expects and, uh, and I think we can do better. And that's what we're working towards. Thank you. Okay, other, I'll go to Alderman Hessels just to see if anybody has, I guess I'd look, Alderman Gilmore, first time question. There, we'll, okay, Alderman Hessels for a second time. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I guess I have real problems with it too. 
we, we just hired a fire chief maybe two months ago, and I say it, it should have been pretty well known what was expected. And now we're making a, a really big jump going to a deputy fire chief within such a short span. I, I wish there was some kind of middle ground in here that, that we don't jump to a deputy chief right away, that we, it's new to you, I understand, but there's got to be a way that we can reduce your workload with the fire prevention officer and maybe a chief's assistance. But for us to jump from the fire prevention officer, I figured it out was about $36,000 a year to going to $90,000 a year plus the benefits. It, it's just too big of a jump too quick. And if I look at Pelham, I, they've got one fire chief, one fire prevention officer, but they've got twice the many people. I know fires are the same everywhere. I think we're a little less uh, at risk because we don't have the commercial or the, the heavy traffic as they do, but it just feels like too big of a step for us to be taken though. So I don't know if there's any other way that you could see that you could make it work with something else. If this is a real necessity or if it's kind of something you want, I don't know, I think we need to have that question answered. Through the chair to uh, Alderman Hessels, I, I challenge you to, uh, to talk to anyone who's worked with me in the past, whether it's uh, people that I worked for, people that, I, that worked for me, uh, associations, unions, the provincial uh, fire marshal's office, and ask them if, uh, you know, what kind of a, um, a, a, uh, an intent and what kind of a worker I have been in trying to get on top of issues within the departments that I've worked within. And um, I know what, that they'll say that I'm committed, that I'm doing the work that I need to do. Since I've been here, I've, I don't know if anybody's been around, but um, I've been around to every training session, association meetings. I'm trying to participate in all the uh, meetings within the, associate, within the firefighting group that I can, and, uh, and also attend um, staff meetings at City Hall, attend the regional mutual aid meetings. I had one today. Um, and I'm committing myself fully to this. I, I brought myself up to speed very quickly on where the status of this department is. We need help. You can't keep doing what you're doing here and expect that you're gonna get on top of things and stay on top of things. And I'm pretty good at this job. So, you know, will you get that quality in the next person that you hire once I'm gone? I really don't know. But that person's gonna need help too. If they're as good as I am or better, they're gonna need help as well. So. You can decide what you'd, what you'd like to do within your own municipality, but I'm telling you, with my most expert opinion, what I believe is the best way we should go. Alderman Gilmore. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and just a comment. Thanks for the uh, report, Chief. Um, I think it's important that we, uh, we just remember in context where, where we are right now and where we've been from the beginning of this term. Um, I think we're, personally, I think we're very fortunate to have, uh, to have Chief Smith here with us uh, even, and, and to remember that he's only an interim, he's not staying forever. So it's the ability to groom the next person to, you know, the standards that we expect is one thing. And at that point, I mean, we, we still have the option when, um, when, the chief's um, interim position is, uh, he decides that he's had enough, which hopefully isn't too soon, um, to, uh, to revisit the whole deputy thing when we appoint, when we appoint another chief. And, and possibly at that point, we'll, we'll have the, the history of whatever time you have with, uh, with this candidate. So just to remind us that we need to remember where we've been and, and where we wanna go. Okay, other questions from council members? And I just want to confirm with Adam, who's, who's the clerk tonight, but also the treasurer, that this, this was approved in the budget. Yeah, through you, Madam Mayor, to all of council. So as part of our 2018 budget deliberation, uh, the salary that Alderman Hessels referred to of $90,000 for this position was incorporated in that and approved as part of the overall budget. Okay, so if the Alderman hustles for a third time. 
Um, I kind of I kind of see this as a as a two part um, thing. The other the other thing I, I do have. If if we don't go external, I'm I'm not sure we're getting the best candidate for our money. I, I think there might be candidates out there that have a whole lot more education and and knowledge and experience than what we have from our own department. So I don't know if we could say it. Say um. Okay, I don't know if you're listening or what, but. So that's where I have a, an issue just doing it internally. It is a management position. With any other management positions, we've always went external, like uh, the fire chiefs, we went external. CAO, we went external. Director of operations, we went external. So now we're throwing another management position in there, and we're just doing it internally. I'm, I'm not sure if we're going to get the very best candidate we can for that kind of uh, money. I would look to the chief maybe to respond to to that. Uh, through the chair, I stated this before, but I really believe that we need to um, have confidence in the people that currently work within the municipality. And uh, our firefighters, I believe, are engaged, they're enthusiastic. Uh, we have people who do have experience. We have, we have people that do have some educational background in fire, and I'd like to exploit that before we go outside and look for external people to bring into our municipality. Um, so that's my position. I think I, I'd still like to ask, ask council to um, proceed with the existing process. If we don't find a suitable candidate internally, I'm not gonna put somebody in the position if they can't do the job because it won't help me. So uh, if it doesn't work out, we will go outside. And you know, the, the other thing is that um, as part of the, uh, the hiring panel, I want to bring in a fire chief from outside as well. So it's not just me stating this, it'll be an agreement from another fire chief from outside that says, yes, this person is also acceptable in their eyes. Okay, so any further questions from council? All right, so seeing none then, I will call the question on the report. All those in favor? I was gonna say recorded vote. Recorded vote, sure. So Adam, I'll look to you to do a recorded vote. Alderman Dykstra? In favor. Alderman Gilmore? In favor. Alderman Hessels? Opposed. Alderman Conk? In favor. Mayor Jeffs? In favor. Okay, so that is carried. So now, uh, Adam, I will go back to you for the uh, Burnaby Fire Station report. That fire staff report FSR 002-2018 regarding Burnaby Fire Station and the recommendations contained therein be adopted as circulated. Okay, so I need a mover and a seconder to get this on the floor. Moved by Alderman Conk, seconded by Alderman Dykstra, and now I'll hand it back over to the Chief. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, we have, have met as a, uh, as a group a number of times since, uh, since I've been here. And uh, we have the fire station implementation committee that's been dealing with it. So I'd like to acknowledge the work of uh, Alderman Dykstra. And we also have the chair of the committee, um, uh, John McClelland, who's in the uh, gallery tonight. So um, they are part of the committee that's come up with this, the recommendation uh, before you. What we're looking to be able to do is go out to the public in uh, an RFP format, which is similar to what initially went out, um, but since we initially went out and we got some numbers that were extremely high, the, num the, uh, the dollar value uh, was identified. Uh, another RFP was uh, designed. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly w how that worked out and, uh, as far as the, the, des the design of it goes, but I think it was done by another consultant. We uh, looked at that design and, and thought about ways that we could go out to the municipality and, uh, or out to the, to the uh, business world and get an RFP that would be suitable for us within our budgeted amount. And so the, the 1.8 that was identified in the budget for that is uh, inclusive of all site work and preparation, which brings us down to probably around 1.3 or 1.4 maximum that we're dealing with. So um, in comparison with other municipalities, we went out and we looked at uh, the Pelham Cream Street station design, which was 7,000 square feet, which was uh, the same size as the original RFP that went out. 
we realized uh, soon after that that uh, today's dollar really likely won't get us that, that, uh, that same build. So we looked at a smaller version of that, which was um, the uh, Lincoln Camden design, which was uh, 4,500 square feet. And although we liked that, it was a traditional build, uh, architectural design, and uh, the current cost of that was um, just under $2.2 million, which is still well over our budgeted amounts. So we put our minds together at the suggestion of the, the, the committee chair and uh, looked at alternative designs, so uh, pre-engineered buildings, um, tilt-up buildings, and which were new to me as far as uh, that design. And we're opening our, our, our minds up to uh, any kind of alternative design, which people may have referred to in the past, like uh, Butler buildings and things like that. This, this RFP that will go out will, I, will be um, uh, suitable when it comes in from a um, pre-engineered design, um, Butler building design, tilt-up design, something like that. And we think that it will provide us with uh, the uh, storage capacity for our vehicles and apparatus room, as well as an internal space that will be conducive to uh, the current operations that we have and also into the future. So if you look at the uh, design uh, on the screen, this area in here with the uh, laser pointer is the apparatus area. So the front of the building is up along this way, which would face Lakeshore. And uh, so there would be three bays that come in here. They're single truck bays, so they're not that long, but, but they're back-in bays, they're not drive-throughs, which is a little bit cheaper. The back of the hall would have uh, a bunker gear area that we could uh, store the gear that's necessary for the firefighters to get on the trucks with. They would park their cars along this side, come through the door, and um, get their gear, go to the trucks, and take them out. So we currently have two operational trucks that, that run from that station. It's leaving us some capacity for the future, but also for any um, uh, of the vehicles that currently aren't in frontline service, but we would have as a backup truck. And so we're trying to do that with the current uh, pumper that we're taking out of service because of the new pumper that's uh, coming into service. And even if we used it for driver training, uh, parades, different things like that, it would make sure that we had all of our frontline vehicles in, in service as much as possible. The other opportunity that would provide in the future, we may be able to accommodate um, an EMS uh, vehicle in that station. So getting into the uh, office area, there's uh, washrooms for male and female that would also provide for uh, accessible washrooms and um, showers. There are two offices in there right now We'd probably need one office. The other office can be used for storage until into the future. Or if we had an additional uh, crew in there from EMS, et cetera, we could use that. There's a storage room inside the uh, main hall area. This is a multi-purpose room area in here that can be used for training. It can be used for meetings. It could be used for a variety of different things. The intent isn't to rent it out to the public and have them come in and have functions and things. This is for uh, municipal use only is what we were identifying it for. It has a kitchen area on the side, but it's not a separate kitchen. It just has some sink and fridge and different things that are uh, necessities. And uh, this is all open space outside, which is a covered patio area. A mechanical room to house everything in the back and another storage room for um, things that would be applicable to the trucks in the apparatus bay. This dotted line across here would indicate the possibility for a mezzanine. So we'd have to have a stairwell that would be incorporated into that as well, but could be used for additional storage of uh, larger, bulkier things out in the apparatus floor. Um, this whole station is just over 5,000 square feet. It's a compromise from the 7,000 that was originally designed for, but we felt that it would be sufficient. It's not extravagant by any stretch of the imagination, but it would provide for capacity today and into the future. So what we're asking, the, the, uh, the last council report that came forward was trying to um, take advantage of a tender process instead of an RFP process. We believe there's still some room for um, the uh, applicants to come in with their own design ideas, and so we're looking for an RFP again to go out with. This will be roughly a 30-day process that we would have, do an evaluation, and then turn it around back to council at the earliest opportunity so that they can break ground on this within the current year. Um, if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to answer. Any questions from council members to the chief? Okay, seeing none then, uh, I will, okay, so I will call the question on the report. All those in favor? 
Opposed, if any, and that is carried. Okay, so now we'll move on to the planning staff reports. The planning staff report PSR 003-2018 regarding the Committee of Adjustment hearing schedule and the recommendations contained therein be adopted as circulated. So I need a mover and a seconder for that. Moved by Alderman Hessel, seconded by Alderman Conk. Any quest? well, I guess we've got a, I think, a recommendation on this. So um, anyway, questions or comments on this one? So just to confirm, we do have to provide direction um, to staff. So I don't know who wants to go first. Alderman Hassels. <clears throat> yeah. Well, there, mu there must be a reason why this came up. So I I'm not sure which which people want. Okay. Y you <laughs> must uh, might have an idea on what times were best appropriate for it. And it's it's only once a month, right? Like so, I, I know there's a little bit of a cost involved, but I, I don't think that should deter us from going to a later later time. And then you are also saying they can they can come in later that day, so that they're still putting in their same amount of hours. Like instead of coming in at eight or nine, they can come in at ten or eleven. So I don't know. I I think if staff's good with that, I I would probably say six or seven o'clock would be a, be a good time to do it. Okay, I don't know, Alderman Conk, did you want to speak to it? Be um, because you you had received some comments from residents, so I don't know if you think that's a good time or if even five, you know, 5.30 would work, or uh, I'm not... Uh... Well, I, I was thinking um, if some... Through you, through you, Madam Mayor, I'm sorry. Um, I was thinking that had we had a resident who needed to be um, at the Committee of Adjustment meeting and he works, he or she works, in St. Catharines and is done at five. If we had the meeting at six, that would give them, hopefully, depending on weather, um, six o'clock would give them time to get from St. Catharines to here. It's usually a 40 minute drive, um, again, depending on the weather. So I would opt for either six or 6.30. Okay, so we have to make that as an amendment to the report then. So uh, you're pointing at Alderman Dykstra? Did you have a? <laughs> I didn't see that. Well, before we made the amendment, I did. I did want to ask Sarah, because going. I mean, the members of our committee of adjustment committee as well, going on a going forward basis, we we ask for application of committee members, future committee members, and it's really hard for somebody that has a day job to be um, a committee member if they work till five o'clock. So, have you had any? conflicts with the current committee like as far as that i know they have a little bit of a they have an extra i think so they have a revolving schedule but if somebody had a day job they may think twice about putting their name in as a committee of adjustment member because they would have to miss work to go to a meeting so yeah, through you madam mayor to alderman dextra um that certainly it works, yeah, it works both ways. So both applicants being available, but also uh, potential um, members of the committee. Um, in terms of the current committee, I believe one of them has a, a day job from like nine to five. Um, so he takes time off of work to attend the, the committee hearing. So um, having them in the evening would you know, enable him to not have to miss that much work. Okay, thank you. Just. Uh Okay, so Alderman Conk, maybe I look to you to make the amendment. Okay, for six o'clock. Okay, so can I get a seconder for that? Alderman Hassels. So any discussion on the amendment to the report? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor, that's carried. And then so we're back to the balance of the report as amended. So uh, if there aren't any, Hold on. If there aren't any uh, further questions, I'll call the question. All those in favor? That is carried. And then we'll uh, move on to the second planning report. The planning staff report, PSR 004-2018, regarding additional definitions for the official plan and the recommendations contained therein be adopted as circulated. Mover and a seconder for this one. Moved by Alderman Conk, seconded by Alderman Gilmore. Um, any questions or discussion on this one, Alderman Conk? 
Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think I was probably the, the impetus behind this report, too. I, I remember asking um, at the July 18th meeting uh, what the definitions were for, the, for these three things. And, and um, I'm sorry, um, but I can't support any of this. Um, Sarah, you have said that um, you're good with indirectly defined. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not good with indirectly defined. I think we need an official plan that gives us a definite definition of these three things and where intensified development is concerned, um, I believe that we need to have um, somewhere in that um, definition uh, the fact that we've been um, designated as zero growth both by the province and the, and the region, I believe. Um, so, so that definition needs, to, I personally, I think needs to be um, tightened up a little bit. Um, I'm not happy with uh, the definition of character of the neighborhood and um, limited residential development. Again, um, you seem to be happy with be having an indirectly def in indirect definition. And, and again, I'm sorry, that's not good enough for our official plan, I don't think. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering, um, with regards to um, intensified development, perhaps you can, you can tell me, is there an intensification target for the, the township by the region? Um, through the, the Mayor Tildman, um, Conk. So we have growth statistics, but as you're aware, that yep. policy has been deferred. So the region is responsible for the growth allocation for the, the member municipalities within the region. Um, and when we were doing our official plan, they were kind of on the cusp of reviewing their growth allocation. So that policy has been deferred. But in terms of our target, that would be the policy that we rely on is those growth numbers. So perhaps those figures, even though... Um, the region has admitted that the figures that they gave were incorrect and highly inflated, um, I think need to be part of uh, the intensification definition. And um, so we know, okay, so you've answered that question. So um, I'm also going to suggest that, um, I mean, I'm, I am just one vote and I'm not happy with this report at all. Um, I'm, I'm going to suggest that we, we might want to go out to the, to the municipality to see what our residents think of, of these definitions and if they have something that they would like to see put into these definitions that go into our official plan because this is their official plan. I'm just going to have the seat. We, we, of course, discussed the report prior to the council meeting, so I'm just going to look to the uh, CAO to comment on that. You, Madam Mayor, um, uh, we did have opportunity to very quickly uh, review the report and uh, materials prior to the meeting. Um, in looking at definitions contained within uh, the official plan, there is opportunity um, by leaving some um, uh, ability for staff to apply interpretations on an application by application process as an official plan is really a broader framework um, and, and intended to establish gui broader guidelines for development that are implemented more specifically by a zoning bylaw um, uh, going forward. That said, um, your comments about uh, engaging the community and, and attempting to determine uh, perhaps a, a better feel of what the community uh, seeks um, it is certainly an appropriate course of action to take, and and perhaps uh, through the, the the official plan uh, review process, which does require public hearings, does require consultation and engagement, um, we can get that kind of feedback back on what is being proposed or what should be proposed. But uh, perhaps what we need is a starting point right now um, for definitions that we can put before the community. And whether that is these ones that you have before you now, which would then go through the consultation process uh, and feedback prior to adoption, or 
again, in a pinch, if, if you wanted to go and do that consultation first, come back with revised definitions, and then bring those revised definitions through the consultation process. Either way, there's consultation that, that can happen. So I, I think we're at your direction on the, the magnitude or how deeply you want to go to the public on this, and we will take your direction as you see fit. Um, so through you, Madam Mayor, um, again, it, that, it's just my opinion, and I'm, I'm more than willing to, you know, have rest of council weigh in on this, but um, the, I, these definitions, I, I think, are I'm not in love with them, um, but they are a starting point, as you suggested, so um, I think maybe we could take these definitions that have been given us in this report and put them out to the public and see what kind of uh, feedback that we do get. Is I think that might be a good starting point. So that's the the motion then that to okay. Yeah, I'm good with that. Okay, so to go back to put these out to the public and then have the input. Okay, so I need a seconder for that motion, seconded by uh, Alderman Dykstra. So amendment to the report. So I will call the question. All those in favor? That is carried. Um, so any further discussion on the report as amended? Okay, seeing none. I will call the question, all those in favor, and that is carried. Okay, so now we are on to correspondence, and we have three that we, um, oh, sorry, got to wait for Alderman Hassels. So we have three that, uh, that we are dealing with tonight, so, um, so the first one is a resolution from Welland City Council regarding uh, MPCA representative. So I know that we had a report back, I can't remember when it was, um, regarding this, I think back in the summer or early fall um, on this one. So, so I'll look to council to, for discussion on this uh, request from Welland or um, you know, how we wanna handle it. Um, so yeah. Alderman Conk. Through you, Madam Mayor. Um, I fully support um, what Welland has um, put out there, and I, I do believe um, St. Catharines supported it as well. So, um, I mean, the MPCA has been front and center for at least the last year, if not two, um, and and the makeup of, of the board has, has been, has come under fire a, a number of times. And um, I, I personally don't think that we need to have all appointed uh, board members. There, I think there does need to be a combination of appointees and elected officials just to keep a balance. Um, but um, I, think, I, I believe that we need to support this and let the region know that, that um, we wanna have a say in how how the representative for Wayne Fleet gets decided whether the incoming council wants to put a council member on the board or whether they want to appoint someone. I, I think that's fair. Call me so, council. so I just looked at staff supporting the resolution. Then it is is just endorsing Welland, or then does that make us have an actionable item? Because again, we kind of discuss what that might look like, and we've already got quite a bit of information. Um, regarding that from the previous report. So maybe I get the CAO to, sorry to baptism by fire tonight. Um, through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I, again, uh, the report, the, the motion from Welland is being circulated to uh, all the area municipalities uh, for their uh, information, consideration, and support. Um, in the event that uh, this council uh, elects to, um, to support the motion, uh, that's item one, um, if, if you want to go further and provide direction to uh, staff at this municipality to uh, uh, participate or engage or follow similar actions, uh, that would be step two of the motion. So step one is just a basic support. Welland will be doing all that work and investigation um, and proceeding to fire that through to the region and the NPCA. Step two is whether you want us to investigate and participate and do a similar process for us. Back to me. Um, personally, I would like to see 
this council stand up and make its voice heard with regards to um, how we want to, to see our representative seated at that board table. Um, again, I am just one vote, and, and um, I think we should be telling the region that we want control of, of how we select our own board member. So if that means that we make our own motion to send it to the, to the region to suggest that we too would like to, um, to, to take that opportunity come the top of the next term, I think that's what we should do. So I'm, I'm willing to make that motion. Okay, so the motion is supporting this and then directing our staff to, to do what Welland's doing, yes. taking the appropriate measures. Okay, um, so is there a seconder for that motion? Seconded by Alderman Gilmore. So any further discussion on that? And we're clear on that with the clerk. All right, seeing none, then I'll call the question. All those in favor? And that is carried. Okay, um, so then we have the correspondence from Fort Erie. Um, so I don't know who wants to tackle that. And I know that there, it's, it's a financial request that we don't have um, in the budget, and I know there was kind of a suggestion looking to, well, I, I, I don't know, I don't want to put you on the spot, Chief, but you had kind of given us a, a brief overview of um, this piece of correspondence from the town of Fort Erie, and I think, yeah, sorry, we're talking cryptically, making you guess as to what we're talking about. So I don't know, do you mind just kind of reiterating what you were sharing with us earlier today and just for a little bit of context for council? Um, yes, um, Madam Mayor, we uh, in the fire service have been uh, um, initiating some of this process to, uh, to deal uh, with this situation, and uh, it came from primarily Niagara Falls and Fort Erie, who uh, put together a program that would uh, help to train firefighters to be able to recognize some of the signs of uh, people that may be in uh, in, in need of um, direction, assistance, and uh, some information that can be passed on to them regarding sources of assistance that they can seek out, um, and uh, and also to to pass on information that would be useful to them. Uh, to be able to maybe avoid the situation that they're in. And this is a problem that's been identified uh, widespread across the Niagara region, more predominantly in some of the other uh, larger municipal areas, but uh, we're very close to a border, which makes it more uh, readily available to have people uh, being uh, abducted or placed into situations where they, um, they may be um, you know, uh, held against their will, et cetera. So, um, this was uh, another community outreach uh, issue that came to the uh, awareness of the fire service and it was just a step up kind of thing to, uh, to be involved in and to help promote um, the safe return of some of these people. Okay, oh, and I'll uh, turn to our CAO. Uh, and uh, just further that, to that, Madam Mayor, uh, through you, um, in, in again, reviewing the original motions of support, um, they are clearly indicating or identifying that uh, these all stem from a, uh, a proposal by the Halliburton Kawartha Lakes Brock MPP uh, regarding uh, provincial legislation attempting to deal with uh, human trafficking issues. Um, and with the region's participation and the involvement of um, the various uh, agencies, uh, support agencies uh, regionally, um, the question becomes from a municipal, lower tier municipal, municipal perspective, um, is, is what, can link, or what can the township of Waynefleet do, my apologies, the township of Waynefleet do um, to, to assist? And again, they, they are proposing a, a financial contribution. Um, not all municipalities have the same capacity to, to bury or to carry. Uh, that type of uh, monetary load. So whether it's a motion of support or a, a small monetary donation, um, we're looking to council for some direction on that. Okay, thank you both for those comments. So yeah, looking to council to looking for some direction as to how we want to handle this. Alderman Hassels. Yeah, uh, I don't mind supporting it, but I think um, that the, the dollar value is is kind of way out of our 
thing. If you look per capita, if all the other municipalities, you know, they're throwing in $5,000 and like you look at St. Catharines or Niagara Falls, their population compared to ours, I, I see their, their dollar amounts for us is way beyond what um, we should be or we can contribute. I know we never budgeted for this either, but <clears throat> I don't know, I, I would say if, if we did this year a $500 uh, donation, I think we can probably find that someplace and then you can include it in next year's budget, try to get a better idea what other municipalities are paying per capita and then we could kind of follow suit that way. But for now, it's kind of unexpected. It's after our budget deliberation. So I, if we can find $500, I would recommend we do that. So that's your motion, 500, supporting this supporting and $500. That. Okay. Um, seconder for that, Alderman Conk. Any discussion on uh, Alderman Conk? Um, so if, if we went down the, the road that Alderman Hessels is suggesting, Adam, would you uh, just automatically send out a request for this group to fill in the financial um, request? Is, is that something that would automatically be done heading into the budget for next year? Through you, Madam Mayor, to Alderman Conk. Just so I'm clear, so for next year, you'd want us to incorporate the full 5000 or the per capita amount or encourage them to apply yeah. as part of our grant? Yeah. So the applying as part of the grant, is that the way you're, you're yeah. kind of going? Yeah, we can certainly, uh, with kind of our notification to them that we're contributing the $500, we'll send them our grant package and let them know that the deadline is November 1st, 2018 for consideration into the 2019 budget. So we can certainly do that as part of the correspondence. Okay, so if there aren't any further questions, I'll call the question, all those in favor, and that is carried. And then the last one is um, the raise the flag for autism awareness, and we do this every year. Um, so Alderman Hessels, you're moving to support? Yep. Okay, and seconder Alderman Dykstra, I, any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor, and that is carried. So now we're on to bylaws. Let the following bylaws be read and passed this sixth day of March, 2018. Bylaw number 007-2018 being a bylaw to appoint a chief administrative officer and clerk pursuant to section 11, section 229, and section 228, subsection one of the Municipal Act as amended and bylaw number 008-2018 being a bylaw to prohibit and regulate animals being at large. So a mover and a seconder for the bylaws, moved by Alderman Gilmore and seconded by Alderman Dykstra. Any discussion or questions? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor, and that is carried. Okay, uh, notices of motion. Okay, no notices of motion, and we don't have any proclamation, so I can't help but smirk. We'll go to other business. Alderman Conk is back. Um, so does anybody have other business? Or do we want to let Alderman Conk go first? We'll let her go first. Okay. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, um, I'm just, uh, I have had a request um, because there was some chatter and some social media that went on with regards to um, I think it was at the regional level, a request for the MPCA to publish the severances, the retirement uh, packages, blah, 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 for all of their staff that they have seen come and go over. And I immediately was bombarded with some emails asking if the Township of Waynefleet would consider uh, publishing those, not mentioning names, just the dollar amounts. Um, there wasn't a time frame, so I'm going to suggest if, if there's an appetite to do this and publish those amounts from uh, 2011 through to 2017. Okay, I don't know if staff wants to comment on that or to do, I don't know if there's any kind of, if you like, get the treasurer to comment to that and yeah through you madam mayor to alderman conk so staff can certainly look into what we can and cannot provide um under the privacy personal privacy and protection act there are certain stipulations as to what we can and cannot provide when it comes to specific individuals 
and in certain amounts of their compensation. So we'd have to look into the rules, determine what we can and cannot provide. Uh, so likely we'd need to bring a staff report back to you, identifying what would be allowed under the Privacy Act legislation. Um, at that point, then we can get council to provide further direction as to what they want to do proceeding at that point. Uh, just one other thing, um, and, and I could be totally off the wall with regards to this, but the information that I have been given is that the Committee of Adjustment seats four out of the five members um, all of the time, I've been told, which means that if there's a tie vote, the you know it's lost and it's not fair. That I mean, I, this is the information that I've been. Told. So I said, okay, let me go ask council and see what's going on. I did take a look at the uh, the bylaw for the committee of adjustment. It doesn't really tell us. Um, it does tell us that there are five members, but it doesn't say how many seat at one time. I thought there were three that, and they and they rotated. Um, but so, can somebody <coughs> clarify for me? So through you, Madam Mayor, Alderman uh, Kong. Uh, prior to before my predecessor, um, you're right. There used to be so there's five members of the committee of adjustment, and three used to sit at a time, and they would rotate month to month. Uh, my predecessor then implemented this new way where all five members sit at every hearing, um, so still maintaining that odd number. Right. Um, and all five members do have a vote, like council. Uh, it's very similar. So the chair has the ability to vote on applications. Um, the situation, there have been some situations where there's only been four members at the meeting. Um, in recent history, it was because one of the app, uh, committee members had an application before the committee. Um, and I know prior to my taking the position, sometimes there was an illness that prevented someone from being there. So it resulted in four voting members. Um, and per Robert's rules of order, if you have a tie vote, then the motion is defeated. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So, so, but typically the five sit just the way council. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, other, other business, Alderman Hessels. Um, yeah, just that brings up a, a good point too, because uh, with us in council, we're gonna be stuck with four people here too at a council meeting, and you could have the same thing. And um, I think I did bring it up at one time. Uh, I, I don't know if we should, what is it, change our, our protocol or whatever, but that the mayor only votes to break up the tie could that be a possibility? Because we will be a short council. So. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, um, one of the provisions contained in the Municipal Act is that every member of council is entitled to and shall vote on all, all matters put before them. So as it stands, if you are a member of council and you are present at the meeting, um, you are voting on every matter uh, unless you declare an interest and step away from the table for that for that matter. Um, as to sort of going forward, um, I, there are a whole bunch of permutations and combinations of what could potentially happen. And um, my suggestion or recommendation would be that uh, we do bring back a, a, perhaps a formal staff report uh, to lay that out for you and give you uh, a clear understanding and framework of what will happen under the different scenarios, and uh, then you can make an informed decision on how you want to proceed at the appropriate time uh, should the need arise. Uh, again, the need may not arise, um, or it may be of such limited duration. Uh, again, so many different options, um, but we can bring a report to address that for you. No, that would be great because it, it could Hopefully it's never an issue, but it could be, and I'd rather address it beforehand than when we get to that point. Okay, my other um, announcements are whatever, and I, I, I see you do site visits yet, and uh, there's uh, actually four businesses in Wingfleet on next Wednesday, and they're farm tours, dairy operations, and they're all in the area here, So, and it's from 10 to 3. It might be a good thing for people to get out to go to, and... Um, the other thing is Monte Carlo night 
It's uh, the Wingfleet Lions put that on, and it's going to be here in Wingfleet this year. It's always been in the Wellingport Community Hall the last bunch of years, but they're bringing it back to Wingfleet. So they'd, uh, they'd appreciate it if you want to support them or come out for their, uh, their dinner or whatever. <coughs> and let me see, planning. Uh, March 20, uh, 27th, I think, on, on a Wednesday. I think that's a Wednesday. So, so what's that? No, okay, it's on a Wednesday, so it'd be the 28th then. Yeah, so sorry about that. So yeah, that, those were, uh, I thought I had something else. Uh, Monte Carlo. Oh, and then uh, also the fire department's got a fish fry on, uh, on March 30th. So that's an, another event to go to. And then it's a little ways off. I'll bring it up maybe next month again. But um, the Niagara Federation, Niagara North and Niagara South Federation of Agriculture are going to have a farm day. It's, it's kind of a mini, mini farm uh, educational thing. And it'll be at the Niagara West uh, Fairgrounds. And that's on April 21st. And that'll be, that's a Saturday. It's a whole day event. You just can come and go as you want, free admission. So those are a few things that are happening in the area that people might be willing to take some interest in. And actually, if I can continue, um, so we had the presentation from the, from the Dave Murray from the plowing match. I, I'm not sure how we want to go forward with this to find out if there's a appetite for it or like, it, it kind of scared me. It sounded like a pretty big, uh, big undertaking, but I don't know how we get out there to throw it out to see if there's an appetite. I, I, I would think we should ask this guy to come to the region as a delegate and, and throw his thing there because, yeah, for Wingfleet, it we won't reap the benefits like the region will. So, so yeah, I'm just wondering how we go forward. I'll look to uh, our CAO to comment on that. Um, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, perhaps what I can do is reach out to uh, Mr. Murray um, over the next uh, uh, couple of days, next week or so, um, have some discussions with him about options, about uh, what Wayne Fleet could do, uh, what the region could do, um, what some of our neighboring municipalities could do, and then we could perhaps come back with uh, some information for you at, at an upcoming meeting about uh, alternatives. Um, it, it does sound like an incredible opportunity um, for the municipalities involved. Um, it does need coordination at a much higher level than us, uh, than, than the lower tier municipality, uh, but it is something we can look into and come back to you. Okay, awesome. Any other business from other people here sitting at the council chamber? No. All right, seeing none then, I'll get Adam to read the confirming Bylaw. The bylaw number 009, 2018, being a bylaw to adopt, ratify, and confirm the actions of the council at its regular meeting held on the 6th day of March, be read and passed this 6th day of March, 2018. Terry, or Alderman Gilmore, and Alderman Dykstra, all those in favor, that is, that is carried. And then... Uh, I need a motion to adjourn. Alderman Hessels, Alderman Conk, all those in favor, and that is carried.